All right. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Zvi Mauschkowitz. He writes a substack called Don't Worry About the Vase, where he shares what is probably the internet's most comprehensive update on everything that's happening in AI each week, along with a variety of other interesting topics, including rationality, policy, game design, and a lot more. Zvi was also one of the most successful professional players of Magic the Gathering and went on to become a trader and startup founder. So Zvi, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. All right. So first question, you played Magic the Gathering professionally for several years and were inducted into the Hall of Fame. There's this interesting post I read the other day by Reed Hoffman, where he talks about what makes a good strategy game for application to life. And so his core idea was that sort of when you think about games like chess or Go, which require mental focus and dedication, they don't actually teach you to be strategic in ways that match how the world works. So there's like no outside variables like luck, weather, or external market forces. You're kind of just like memorizing the best move in any given situation. So my question for you is what are the key characteristics in your mind of a good strategy game? So there's several different questions here, right? There's the question of what is a good strategy game? And there's the question of what is a good strategy game for the specific purpose of developing particular life skills or life skills in general, which is more what I think that Reed was talking about in that statement. So I think he's selling chess and especially Go short in the sense that if your plan for Go is to memorize all of the best moves on a 19 by 19 board where each move involves picking one square and where there is no obvious causal link on many moves where you are forced to do anything, I think you're gonna have a really bad time. I think that this is the reason why people thought that AI was gonna have a really hard time with Go and why it's significantly harder for AI than chess or traditionally viewed that way. And like you don't get good at Go purely through memorization any more than you get purely good at life through memorization. You get good at Go by understanding the principles and figuring out how to think about Go and how to relate to positions to previous positions. And even games like Chess and Go, even though they technically have no luck, effectively do have substantial amounts of luck because exactly what opponent you're facing, how they choose to move, what happens in the game beyond your amount of ply that you're able to look forward into the game are things that you have very little control over. And effectively, you know, if two players of similar skill levels meet, sometimes one will win, sometimes the other will win, sometimes it will be a draw, even if they are both like comparatively on their game, so to speak. They won't just all be draws because the players are equally matched. And, you know, you still certainly learn certain forms of strategicness from a game like that. It's just a very narrow compared to what a game like Magic can teach you. So Magic definitely has these other aspects where like the game's components and background and rules are constantly changing and you have to take into account like completely unexpected dynamics where you have unknown unknowns and the game can throw anything at you at any time and you just have to continuously adapt and i definitely think that helps you a lot and it makes for a better game over time in other ways as well as does the luck component being more present uh, the biggest problem with chess and go is if i play you in a game of chess chances are very high, even though I have never talked to you before, that either you will crush me every game or I will crush you every game, right? Like, I don't know which one because I don't know if you're any good at chess. But the chance that you are within about plus or minus two or 300 points of me is not that high. On the standard ELO scale, 90% plus of chess players will not be able to give me a good game because either I will crush them or they will crush me. And that's true for basically every chess player, right? There's a, there is no range where a lot of chess players are. This is not how it works. Go has a better handicap system, so you can use handicap stones to create a reasonable game much better than you can handicap chess. But if you don't want to allow to use that, then you'd have even worse of the same problem, is my understanding. It certainly would be pretty bad. Whereas Magic, I can play almost anybody, and they have a chance, right? The game can still be interesting in some sense. Taking my win percentage from you know 90 to 95, or one to 10, is an interesting challenge, even if I am either very undermatched or very overmatched uh, in that situation. And there's always new things to be figuring out, new aspects to consider. Magic players have gone on, in my experience, to do very good jobs at a variety of other games and other challenges that have nothing to do with gaming. But it's always hard to differentiate. I think it develops a lot of great skills, but also I think it attracts a lot of great minds who are very skilled, very talented, very motivated, and they tend to be underappreciated by the outside world and its credentialism. So it's very hard to differentiate, like how much of that is magic makes you awesome, 
How much of that is you already were awesome, that's why you played Magic. And how much of that is the other players in Magic were also awesome and you had to hang out with them, right? And it's similar to the way that like, you network in college. You know, while, while prepping for this, I was asking ChatGPT, like, why isn't Magic more popular? And, and one of the reasons it gave is potential cultural perceptions. So in its words, basically, you know, poker is associated with like gambling and like James Bond and suaveness. Uh, you know, chess is like heavily associated with just like raw intellect. But Magic is sort of like a collectible card game with fantasy elements. And that's not like a wide audience that is likely to be interested in that. So in, in your view, would the game benefit by like experimenting with branding and remarketing while keeping the same general outline and rules? Or is the cultural context like part of actually what makes it special? So first of all, there's always many reasons why something isn't more popular than it is. There are reasons chess isn't more popular than it is. There are reasons why hamburgers aren't more popular than they are and so on. Yeah, you know, there's reasons why motherhood and apple pie aren't more popular than they are, even though they are very popular. But magic is actually still, until at least very recently, been growing steadily in popularity. And the number of players who have been playing it, I haven't been following the last year or so, the numbers. But magic, like, sort of fell off of people's cultural, like, awareness radar screen, but became much more of just something that everybody does in the background more often than you would think. And we're recently seeing a new renaissance of game stores in New York City, where I live, that partly reflects this. And the reason why magic cards have gotten so expensive is because there's a fixed pool of older cards that are now desired by a much bigger pool of players. The difference is that we've shifted from competitive gaming, which is often easier to notice in some sense, to the primary way of playing being commander, which is a four player, more casual style of mode. And that mode is more often played around the kitchen table, it's played more casually, and therefore it just sort of isn't noticed. It isn't a cultural phenomenon in the same way, but it's still happening. I think that when you look at the magic cards and the magic uh, setting, that a lot of what you do in magic like, is built around the intuitions we have surrounding, okay, how would this concept work in this type of world? And the reason why we love fantasy in general, is because fantasy settings give us like natural metaphors, natural ways of expressing sort of the things that feel natural to us. And the things that we want to do can always be expressed. Like why are anime settings constantly injecting weird magic into them when the story you're trying to tell doesn't necessarily have anything to do with anything magical, right? Like why is magic just keep showing up in people's stories and novels and such when it doesn't have to be there? Right? It's because it's a crutch, right, in some sense. Right? It, it's, a, it's a storytelling tool that lets you invoke things without having to like, exactly explain the technical mechanisms, but that feel right. And that magic is, in fact, a very, very convenient setting for we just want to be able to do whatever we want to do and have good metaphors for it. And if you want to learn something, having good metaphors, having an intuitive understanding of what it means is much, much better. Like I, have, I am physically unable to learn foreign languages in a reasonable way because my brain is not set up to memorize arbitrary facts. And just like this set of sounds corresponds to this noun or this verb is to my brain an arbitrary set of facts. But magic, I am able to memorize thousands of cards a year, which are effectively new words and barely even blink because they have, they make intuitive sense, right? They all relate to each other. There's pictures that are illustrative. The concepts have names that evoke what they do. And it all ties together. So like my brain is able to synthesize that. And so I don't think you'd want to shift it away. And some people go, oh, that's just silly. It's got pictures of elves and dwarves and, you know, flying unicorns and whatever else they've got. Uh, sure, of course. But, you know, people also love that stuff. They eat it up. So I, I don't think that shifting it would be a particularly good idea. I think that it, you have to go to war for the army you have. You have to use what tools are available. And I think they've done a very good job of that. And, you know, Magic's biggest challenge is basically sustainability. It's as we print more and more cards and we've used more and more of the low-hanging fruit in terms of the names of cards, the concepts of cards, the mechanics, you know, and a lot of players have seen more and more of that over time. Can we still do something that is fresh and new while not being too complex, while still being accessible? while still being like strategically interesting and balanced, you know, when that challenge just continuously gets harder every year. 
Yeah. Maybe another way of phrasing this question is like at the margin, would we benefit from just like raising the status of strategy games and esports in general? So I think it's actually been popular recently where, you know, people say like a great, a great person to fund for a startup founder is like someone who was world-class in any sort of esport because they're just very like, there's takes some amount of intellect, but also like it takes a lot of dedication and like willingness to just figure things out to get to the top of your game here. So like, do you think that we should try to raise the status even higher and this should be something we encourage? I find the word even, I find even higher to be a funny way of describing the status. Yeah, maybe, t- maybe tell me where you think it is now and where you think it should be. I think it's, it, it's in a better spot than it used to be, but the answer to your question is yes, just yes, right? Like very emphatically raising the status of intellectual competition, raising the status of just trying to be the best at something, of trying to accomplish something, of working hard at it, of you know, just being the best or, or trying to be the best, even if you don't succeed at being the best, but like having that mindset, learning those skills, you know, being part of that culture, you know, working on that kind of training, absolutely we should massively raise that. I think it's much better training than what we typically have young people do to develop their skills, develop their capabilities. But also I would say it's not just esports, right? I would also raise the status in this way of sports. If like a successful professional ball player comes to you and says, I want to found a startup. They're not stupid. They work really hard. They know what competition feels like. They know what it means to beat the odds. They know what it means to stay up at night, every night, working harder than everybody else. And, you know, do not take anything for granted, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, like you tell me any professional NFL quarterback, you know, I will maybe have a brain scan to make sure they haven't taken too many head injuries. But <laughs> subject to that, like, yeah, to shut up and take my money and go build your thing. Like, I don't even know, care what it is. Go. Oh. Like, so it's not just us. And I would extend that also to basically anything, right? Like, just be really good at something, right? And then having been really good at something hard, something that requires struggle, something that requires lots and lots of training and effort, even if the prizes were not so good, that means that you were intrinsically motivated to do that. That tells me you're probably going to be really good at other things, right? And I, I have related to so many other things. Like, so in show businesses, like we see people, you know, who are good at one aspect of the business usually end up being really good if they put their minds to it at other aspects of the business, right? Like, why are these actors good at directing, right? Like, what, there's, why is there an overlap here? Partly it's because they pick up a lot of knowledge from acting, but partly it's just because you succeed at one trade that's really competitive and hard. It means you've got what it takes to learn something else. And, you know, therefore, you know, you, you sing a bunch of songs and even if you didn't start out that way, you often end up writing them, you know, and many other seemingly much less related things work the same way. So I would say, yeah, show me a speed runner who's really good at speed running and I'll show you a good founder. How important do you think first mover advantage is going to be for LLMs? So, you know, that, I, I feel like a common analogy here is like Google search, right? So on the consumer side, especially today, there's like just no reason why someone can't go create a replica of Google. And it could probably even be a lot cleaner with like less ads and give you maybe more, more favorable results. And we could debate like the nuance there, but it doesn't seem like, you know, too, too challenging. But Google is just like the de facto default. They have partnerships with Apple so that they're going to be like the go-to on Safari whenever you open your app. And for 95% of people, that's just going to be okay. Where do you see this playing out with LLMs over the next few years? So I, I would dispute that it's easy to do as well as Google search at search. Uh, despite all of its difficulties, it has considerable effort been put into a number of competitors. Those competitors keep not taking that much market share. I know a lot of people who are constantly complaining how bad Google search is for them and how much it's not what they want and who would absolutely try you know, any number of additional search engines, and in fact, are using various LMs effectively as new search engines because they're unsatisfied with Google search. And if somebody came to me and offered me a superior product, I think I would quickly take it. You know, that was actually better at my purposes. And like, I tried Perplexity, and it was a pretty good hybrid of a search engine and an LLM. And I used it for some things, but then over time I learned that, you know, for many purposes, just Google search being instantaneous, being like natively tied to the web like it is, you know, sure, giving me the links in an easy form. It just is the product I actually want to a large extent. And sometimes it's not, 
but often it really is. And in that cube, no one's done better. For LMs, I think there's very little lock-in. So, you know, at first I was using GPT-4, right? I mean, first GPT-3.5, and, and then when I got access to a GPT-4, and I was using Bing, and then I was like also trying to use Perplexity, and then I was experimenting with other stuff, and now I use a lot of Claude, and periodically I try to use Bard, and I see if there's anything to use to do with Bard. And because of the way that LM architectures work, the things that you learn working with one LM right now, we're just talking about like the consumer experience in the near term, right? Like not like the long term effects. If you build a better product, I don't think there's much lock in at all. I think it's very, very easy for the consumer to move. Business product, I think there might be a little bit more of we've trained on the exact quirky uh, details of how to get good outputs for our purposes out of this LLM. And we don't want to necessarily move this other LLM. But that's going to happen anyway when GPT-4 becomes GPT-4.5 becomes GPT-5, right? You're going to have to upgrade. Your LLM is never going to be good enough in its current form for very long, and they're continuously training them in ways that disrupt the current instructions. People complain about this of ChatGPT, where they say, well, it got worse. Well, no, it got worse at exactly what you, giving you exactly what you wanted from exactly the thing that you trained to do exactly what you wanted, right? The same way that, like, well, I ordered these, I, you know, five years ago, I ordered these 10 dishes from these five restaurants. And when I try to order exactly these 10 dishes from these five restaurants, again, the experience got worse. Well, of course it did, right? Because, like, one of them closed and one of them changed its menu. And things that improved, you're not noticing, right? So, like, it, the quality of life in general got, went up, but your experience of trying to replicate exactly what you had went down. I talk about like similar things in the Marl Mesa sequence in in weird ways, where like any given thing is almost always getting worse in the exact way that you were previously using it. it doesn't mean the world is getting worse, the world is getting better. And as long as we allow creative disruption, that's gonna be true. So what's gonna happen is continuously, the LMs are gonna improve, and every time they improve, you know, at different times, different people are gonna be ahead in the game unless OpenAI just like it keeps knocking it out of the park and never has a rival, but you know, that's not what we by default, expect we expect Google at least to give them a run for their money at various points. And the big the big question to me is: Does the first mover advantage then lock in enough users early on that gives you more data about what users do, about what users want, about what is a good and good and bad response? You can then use that data advantage to create the net the best next generation product and keep that advantage, right? Like in a practical sense. And that's something we're going to learn over time. But my guess is that you can just pay for feedback and user data that gives you exactly what you want. The amounts of money these companies are willing to throw around are off the charts huge. And it's not that hard to gather a lot of meaningful feedback data. And you can cheat and use feedback data on other LLMs, on your own LLM. So I think in the near term, no, it's, it's going to be pretty competitive. What, what do you think is more important, though, for first thing in first place? like having the consumer market or the enterprise market? My guess is that like right now, it's probably the consumer market. Uh, long term, the business market will probably be the bulk of queries, if I had to guess, simply because we're going to start having lots and lots of businesses that like use it constantly internally. They're use, their, their employees are using it day to day lives. But it, because of the need to protect the data, they're using it in an internal specialized version rather than the general version. And every time you go to a, you know, where you would currently talk to a customer service rep, you're talking to an AI and constantly places where you currently aren't using intelligence, businesses are incorporating AI into their products. And all of this like potentially overwhelms the uses of chatbots and also has a lot more lock-in. So if I was like looking to build a moat, was looking to build a long-term future, I'd be worried more about uh, corporate relationships than I would be about the consumer facing business, except insofar as the consumer facing business causes you to form business relationships. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I might have gone the other way. Like, I, I don't have a super strong view here, but uh, kind of with the Google analogy, I guess, is what I was getting at in the beginning, where it's like, once you have a consumer product that's just like a winner, unless you really blow it out of the market with something that is like clearly better, consumers tend to have not that much motivation to switch their, work, switch their workflow, at least like, you know, the, the median or like typical consumer who, who isn't like thinking about these things all day. Whereas the enterprise, if you you know, figure out a way better product. Like, yeah, there's like some degree of lock-in, but it's a little bit easier to just walk up to them and say like, our product is better. It saves you money. It's going to improve these metrics in your business. You should switch and get them to do it. I mean, the, the business has to do a lot of work. The business has to actually like learn, you know, train a new fine-tuned potentially model 
It has to learn how to transpose all of the queries. It has to do all of its safety work over again. It has to do all of its make sure this tells this gives the exact answer we want to give to all of these queries works over again. I think that the difficulty of switching here is going to be in many ways non trivial. The consumer, on the other hand, is a very sloppy product that can afford a lot of slack and error, and where switching over is literally just going to a different website with or without paying a subscription. And right now, you know, only ChatGPT really requires a subscription to get the consumer experience that you want. And GPT three and a half is already pretty good and free even then. And you can get GPT four from Bing if you really want to again for free. So yeah, the question is like how much is just consumer habit going to be like a force more powerful than actual switching costs at that point. And right now my guess is it's not very high because the people who are using the product are early adapters. Right? The future is very evenly distributed. Most people still don't really understand what ChatGPT is. You'll see the occasional sign on college game day that talks about ChatGPT or the occasional joke that insults someone for being like ChatGPT. And people kind of like, I understood that reference, like level of knowledge, but most people still haven't actually tried it. So t to me, like at least the most impressive use that I've gotten out of ChatGPT is like, by far been uh, just coding. Like I'm a total noob at coding. I don't really know what I'm doing, but asking it like just basic questions about like, how would I create a flask app in Python? And like, can you teach me about databases? Like it'll just give you a step-by-step, -step, like here are the 10 things that you would do. And this would take a typical programmer two weeks. And I'm like, okay, let's start with step one, break this down into, you know, 50 more steps. And then let's chunk it and like, do, just show me the code that I need to input. And then if you like copy and paste an error, it tells you exactly why it thinks you're getting the error. It understands like, you know, what IDE you're using and like how to change the settings. Like it, it, it's really miraculous, right? And so do you expect there to be at, on, on some length of time, like a massive influx of software founders who realize that like, oh, I can actually just get an MVP at the door and learn to code in about a 10th or a fifth of the time that I was able to do you know, two years ago. And so you have people that are maybe more traditionally like a McKinsey consultant or work at an investment bank or something like, oh, now like tech just became the, the, the barrier to entry is now like much, much smaller. And this technical co-founder or really technical person that I used to need, that I still need them to join my team at some point, but I can get started on my own. Do you think that this will cause a change with people that aren't natively in tech trying to build software? Yes. I, I think that we absolutely will. I, I went from, there is no way it would make any sense for me to ever try and code almost anything that isn't deeply, deeply simple to, if I wasn't so goddamn busy every, every minute of the day, look at all these cool tools that I think I can just build. And I get tempted even so to be like, you know what, what if I just did a hackathon for a weekend, even though I have no idea what I'm doing? Like I have the architecture skill, right? Like I am very good at figuring out how computer programs are supposed to work, how they would go about doing a thing. I'm just really bad at writing the actual code. And so I have something like, you know, at least 10 X probably my ability to code meaningful things within a given period of time without like actually getting a coder to do it. And it's plausible. It's a hundred X that it just went from basically you can't to no, really you just can. It's just that I have so many other things that I want to do constantly that are fighting for my attention. Yeah, I spent like a couple of weekends on it a, a, a little while ago, like around when GPT-4 became like publicly available if you're paying for it. And yeah, I, I had the same experience. I was like, I, I couldn't code before. And I I, saw, I wouldn't say like I'm a good coder, but like it, it gives you the ability to actually build something in like a short form of time, which is like pretty astounding. Yeah, if, if I had my current level of coding ability with GPT-4 uh, five or 10 years ago, at the time when I was trying to code things, I would have been a very, very good coder very quickly compared to everyone else who didn't have it. I think this leapfrogs you pretty fast. Yeah, and even if it's not actually directly writing the code, it like explains things to you if you're getting an error or something, which in a previous life could take like hours for you to get unstuck. Oh yeah, no, the, the biggest thing is just, it'll actually answer your questions for real. And you can ask clarifying questions and it will tell you and, and you can sort things out. And especially back then when I was trying to do things that were very much like data processing, like building in algorithms that did things I wanted to do, like not requiring anything that had happened in the last two years, essentially. Um, it would have been very, very good at helping me through almost all of that.
So like, except for the part where I was scraping websites, like it would have been just amazing and the scraping would have just been like, okay, has this thing changed since its data cut off? If it hasn't, we're, we're in great shape. If it has, well, we'll see how well it reads HTML. <laughs> where do you get the most mundane utility today from AI? So I think coding is where I would get it if I was like integrating over like all of the potential things that someone like me might be doing or something like that. But in practice, where I get it is just asking questions. Really like something I don't understand. Like that like hasn't happened. Like it doesn't involve a web search, right? If it's just about like facts about the universe, understanding things, like trying to draw parallels, like just checking intuitions, getting explanations, like really basic stuff. I think that's that's where I get the most uh, utility out of the system right now. Right? And it's really, really good at that. And now if Dolly 3 represents a quantum leap in usefulness of image generation in a way that I don't think people have fully appreciated yet. Uh, we went from, I can generate images, but I can't get the thing that I want. I can get like some vague evocation of something like the thing I want to no, I can get the thing I want. Like actually pretty close with amazing quality is a pretty big change. And I am looking for very, very much forward to the world in which I get good at that over time and the world in which we get uh, the version of Dolly 3 that isn't safety bound and so that I can do the things that it will refuse to do. Like, give me a picture of a public figure, for example. Yeah, yeah. You, you, so you seem like pretty optimistic about all, all the things that you consider like the non-existential like Foom scenario, just mundane utility, like these things, a lot of people kind of have the same worries that they had about Facebook or just the internet in general, where they're worried about misinformation or bad actors using it in ways that, you know, harm politics or something. And am I right here that you're an optimist on most of those sort of concerns for people? Yes. I mean, Tyler Cowen, we have a lot of disagreements about the long-term impact, but we agree on most of the short-term impacts. And his analogy is the printing press. Right? Like this is a lot like the printing press in that it like greatly enhances our ability to share and process information and it's a sea change. And there are going to be people who misuse the printing press, right? People also talk about, well, you know, oh, look, I typed murder is good actually into a word processor. Oh no. Right. Or I called on the phone and I did something and I said a bad, and I said, you know, I said a bad word. Why isn't somebody doing something about this? And the answer is obviously that's stupid, right? Like we, we understand this, we can deal with it. Like, yes, it makes these things easier. But like that's for humans to solve. And in the short term, you know, this is in fact just another tool. And like it's slightly less of just another tool in some senses, but it's mostly just another tool. And I'm confident that we can we can sort this stuff out and, and merge stronger. I'm also very optimistic it can help actively with dealing with these problems, right? If you are getting a bunch of misinformation around the web and people are telling you crazy stories and people are giving you crazy theories, you can type that stuff into an LLM and ask it whether or not this is made up, whether this makes any sense. And that's pretty good. And like a lot of times, there's a lot of social reasons why you can't just ask other people, right? Or you'll get bad answers if you do, because like you're asking them about the thing that people were fooled about. So I'm pretty optimistic that this is uh, going to be not only handleable, but in many ways, an improvement. Yeah, speaking of uh, Tyler Cowen, so you've written before about how him and Mark Andreessen, right? They're, they're probably like two of the most, I, w I don't know what the right word is, but like it, strongly intellectual, really, really are not worried about AI existential risk, like to the point of sort of, um, you know, saying that we shouldn't even be thinking about it at all. We should just turn the dial up all the way to the right and just go maximum fast. And you have this post called the dial of progress where you're sort of arguing that like, you know, there's, they realize that you can't deal with nuance. And so you have two options. You either say like, we're going to go really, really hard on progress or we're not going to go hard on progress at all. And you know, make the case for, well, maybe we should introduce a little bit of nuance and introduce some more dials. So I have, I have some speculation just personally uh, about their public stance and I'd, I'd be curious to get your take on it. So Tyler loves being Straussian or maybe if he doesn't love being it, he loves to like try to look for the Straussian view in, in other people's statements. And so like, if you think about it and there were like zero 
what you would call serious thinkers that are going all in on AI acceleration. It was just a non accounts on Twitter or something. But when you have someone serious like Mark Andreessen and Tyler Cohen, who usually are pretty rigorous in their thinking, saying that we should just go all the way up, the worry is the counterfactual in their mind that they don't exist. And every single smart person who people give credibility to says we need to regulate it really quick. And then the equilibrium ends up being, oh, we just overregulated it and we're kind of in a like, you know, nuclear scenario where we're not realizing the full potential of the technology. But by being the like two prominent people out there who are saying, let's just turn the dial all the way up to the right, it causes people to then, like yourself, make responses to them that are really clear and thought out and introduce more nuance. And so maybe they're not saying exactly what they think. And I'm curious for uh, your view on this. So there's two different, very different cases here, right? For Tyler Cowen, I'm pretty confident it's what he actually thinks based on interactions in person and in Zoom calls and emails and also him being way too smart to think that he is helping if he holds the other view, right? I think that like you're being a little bit unfair in terms of him saying we should charge it all to the right and just accelerate maximally. I think he has more nuance than that but that he understands that, you know, from his perspective, he has to say, yay, progress. He has to say, yay, AI development, because he sees the alternative as turning out worse in practice. But he also, like, is trying to push, you know, the critics to, to be better at, from his perspective, uh, various questions and to take into account various things that he thinks are important and so on. And yeah, also, he's a troll and he's a Straussian and he actively likes making his readers angry. Like his words from his conversation with Tyler summary from the year. Like I'm not like putting words in his mouth. This is him, and I think he enjoys it. And I think he thinks it's good, right? He thinks he thinks it makes people better thinkers. He thinks he thinks people like actually figure things out better when they get enraged by people saying things like this. And that like there's a method to the madness. I just think that what's going on is also involving a failure to think well about what happens like when we get to these future scenarios with very capable artificial intelligences and he just doesn't appreciate like what is about to hit him like you see he's thinking on near-term ai being often very very good right like being very very grounded very very specific but then him and many many other economists in particular seem to have this thing where then they extrapolate into the future and they go into this reference class mode where they're like, well, it's a technological advance that increases human capabilities and it'll be like all the others and blah, blah, blah. And everything's just going to be vaguely normal. And they just don't engage with the actual arguments for why that's not the case in a real way. They, they dismiss them, right? Without really counter-arguing with them other than reference class style arguments in my mind. Uh, Mark Andreessen is a very different other case where I don't think I would call him a careful thinker. Um, I think I would say he's a thinker at all. I think I would say he's someone who's willing to express very strong opinions strongly held, but he is definitely someone who jumps on bandwagons without entirely thinking them through, shall we say? Uh, you can look at his embrace of crypto and Web3, uh, both in terms of his investments and his talking of his book, to see that he will embrace theses that he has not actually very carefully analyzed. Um, he's clearly very pro-progress, very pro-acceleration in general. Um, but also, you know, he talks his book a lot. He is first and foremost a venture capitalist and a businessman. And also, like, is clearly willing also to be a massive, massive troll. Like, if you've seen his Twitter, like, he's a massive. <laughs> yes. Uh, but also, yeah, like, he just, he has a message. He's hammering it through. And he just doesn't want to hear it when there are alternative messages. And if you argue with him and point out where he's wrong, he will often block you. And I'm fortunate that that hasn't happened to me. But... You know, I've tried to be very careful and nuanced and, uh, you know, Mark, you have my email. Uh, one of your partners tried to set us up before this whole thing became a thing. Um, you know, I'm happy to talk and I'm not looking for your money. So, you know, should be friendly. But hey, who knows? Um, I really, really wish we had a government that appreciated, you know, and a culture that appreciated the thing that uh, people like that are trying to say more generally about everything else. And I would, in fact, make the trade of we accelerate everything. Like we, we build our houses, right? We develop our medicines. We, you know, 
educate, innovate education. We just make life super better for everyone. And also, you know, we play fast and loose with artificial intelligence, like relative to what I'd like. I would happily accept that trade. And I've seen a bunch of accelerationists who are like, I'm willing to take that trade, but you can't make that trade. And I'm like, yeah, I can't make that trade. It's not my power. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's too bad. Uh, I tend to call them the unworried, uh, just to be like very neutral, to not imply anything. They call themselves accelerationists, usually, which is the kind of word that like if we made it up for them, it would seem like a really nasty thing to do to them, but they're owning it, so it's fine. Yes, I mean, it's funny. The original term comes from Nick Land, and it's like this kind of like dark philosophical, you know, idea. And so just using it to kind of say like, you know, let's do LLMs a little bit faster is, is always been like and a little bit funny also, to me. <laughs> it, goes, it goes way back before yeah. that. Accelerationism represents the idea originally, as I understand it, of we should make events progress faster, even in directions we don't like, is that we're, because we know that the ultimate outcome is favorable to us. In particular, the old joke where there are two communists on the street and they see a beggar and one of them moves to give him a slice of bread and the other bats his hand away and says, don't delay the revolution. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Peter Thiel had a quote a few years ago that I thought, I have opinions on it, but I want to get yours. He said that uh, crypto is libertarian and AI was communist. And, you know, the idea here is like, oh, if China, you know, when we think about something like the CCP, they're going to get their hands on AI and they're going to use it for facial recognition and it's going to help the totalitarian state and they're going to be able to monitor everything you do. And crypto is this big, like, libertarian force where, you know, we can take away the money from the government and the Fed can't control it anymore. And, like, it's going to make, uh, give all the power to the individual. It seems like it's kind of going in the, like, opposite direction. I don't, I don't, I don't have, like, two strong opinions well, about crypto. The obvious but... question I would ask Peter Thiel if he said that in a private conversation, right, just to probe his intuitions is, so do you think we should avoid building artificial intelligence? Fair right? enough. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the fears about AI are overblown and that we should not be worried about it, right? Like he is another unworried person, right? Who has many criticisms, I think many of which are deeply, deeply unfair about the people advocating to notice that we might all die um, and less in the way of object level explanations for why he thinks we won't. Uh, but he clearly is not a worried person in this context. And there is nothing that Peter Thiel hates more than the communist, Chinese Communist Party, right? <laughs> like, and communism. Yeah. Like, this is his enemy number one. And I don't think that's an unreasonable enemy number one to have. But, you know, if you think that AI is communist, you might not want us to be driving the development of artificial intelligence, sir. And you might want to speak out about it a lot more than you are. And you might want to be funding efforts to not have that happen. And I don't see much in the way of that from him. So I, I find it hard to believe he like has internalized this thing the way that like it, this is implying. Um, and also just, you know, how, how libertarian is crypto? I think it's a very good question. I think crypto has proven not to be what people thought or expected. And that it turns out that the useful cryptos are pretty much just, you know, becoming centralized and under our effect, under the effective control of governments and like everything else and just another means of storing value and like the original promise of all of this stuff has proven to be at least highly questionable and like that's not what people want and so it's become a you know tiny portion of the value but i do understand that the ethos of the people building it is there and that they built certain tools that can be used for those purposes and there's something to it um for ai certainly there are people who claim ai is libertarian and AI wants to be open source and AI will set us all free. And these people are going to get us killed if we, if they enact their agenda. This would be very, very bad. What's the rationale there? I mean, how much time, how long an answer do you want? You tell me. Well, so the, the short version is because AI alignment is an unsolved problem that we do not know how to solve. But even if we did manage to align AI to the wishes of the person who possessed the AI, some people will then choose to align their AI to things we very much do not want. And we will be unable to control the development of AI and AI capabilities. And we'll be unable to, to control competitive dynamics between these things. And offense, favors deep, and offense is usually favored over defense in these situations. And the various dynamics of everybody having their own AI 
will force competitive pressures upon us that will cause us to hand more and more control over to the AIs and have AIs increasing their capabilities and reward the AIs in proportion to how much that their behaviors cause them to be deployed more in the future and have more access to more resources in the future. And then all of us lead rapidly to human extinction, even in the best case scenarios I can think of. I, I think a lot of folks are familiar just with like the, the overall case for AI doom, right? Like, like why it's like very scary to have an intelligence that's smarter than humans like exist. I mean, the, the, I mean obviously the, but, the very basic structure is just, we are about to build smarter things, better optimizers, more capable things, more efficient things, more competitive things than us. How do you think that's going to go? If you think that that is a safe thing to do, I do not know what drugs you are on, but I am deeply, deeply confused why you think that's safe, right? Like ignore all of the technical arguments, ignore all of the difficulties of alignment, ignore all of it. That is not a safe thing to do. Like how many books and movies and thought experiments and intuitions do you need before you realize that is not a safe thing to do. And like arguing that is like less than 1% to have humans stop being in control of the future and stop being the dominant force on the planet. You're just not thinking clearly at all. I'm sorry. Like this is just doesn't make any sense. And everybody who tries to like do a bunch of math and run a bunch of complicated arguments is just missing the forest for the trees. I, I'm like very on board with, with, with that stance. I think what I, um, what I wanted to drill into is like, what do you consider the difference between like everyone having their own AI versus there being some sort of like centralized AI? So for example, like if I access chat GPT on the, uh, in my web browser, is that me having an AI or do I need to like, you know, go access Llama and download it on my computer to have an AI or w what is the difference there between like a company being in control of it and individual humans having their own? So the difference comes from, am I able to restrict how you can modify, how you can instruct, what you can do with your AI and how you can utilize or expand its capabilities and what instructions and, and methods you can use and, and how you can deploy it in a meaningful way or not, right? Like, do I have any control over your decisions with this AI or is this AI fully under your control? And then like, to what degree are we willing to use that? So. If everybody has access to their own instantiation of a fine-tuned GPT N, but that comes with no access to the weights, no right to then just like arbitrarily tell it what it can and can't do, and like reasonable alignment, you know, reasonable effective alignment controls on that system, such that like if you ask it to, you know murder a bunch of kids, it'll be like, no. And if you ask it, how do I build a, you know, fusion bomb in my backyard, it'll be like, no. And, and, you know, so on, or how do I build a smarter AI than this? Like, no, et cetera, et cetera. Then, you know, it's plausible that it could be a central point of failure, central point of, of defense, right? Where only a handful of actors or even one actor are in control of which queries get passed on to this thing that we can contain the competitive dynamics, we can contain the destructive aims, we can handle the situation broadly construed. And I'm simplifying this a lot, obviously. Um, whereas if everybody has root access, the ability to do their own training on the thing with no checks involved, then you can't put any controls on what people do with it whatsoever, right? Like one of the things I repeat over and over again is if you release an open source model, you are releasing the completely unaligned except to the user version of that model within two days, period. Because there are very, very easy ways to fine tune that model such that you remove all of the alignment. So like if you give Llama 2 in its base case, it'll refuse to speak Arabic because it's worried that it's associated with violence, which is itself kind of racist. But, you know, in the name of trying to be harmless, it's actually deeply, deeply racist, which is funny. But if you spend you know, two days, and I think the record is a few hours at this point, uh, fine tuning it, you can get it to answer actual anything that you want. And it's no different from Mistral, right? The system that's designed to just like do literally anything that you ask for. So if that knowledge is there, if that skill is there, if that ability is there, it's yours. Yeah. So, but you also are like an optimist just generally about this mundane utility. So are you 
Are you fine with these models existing today? Or what is the GPT number equivalence of open source where, where you estimate we need to stop open sourcing? So I think this is one of those cases where so like one of the things that Connor Leahy likes to talk about is it's very true. There are only two ways to respond to an exponential. Too early and too late. Right? Like responding to the exponential exactly on time, saying we put the COVID restrictions in on exactly the right day or exactly the right hour is impossible, right? Like that's wrong. That's too late. You need to respond too early. So, and also there's a pattern here, right? Like if we get into the habit of doing this thing, it can be very, very hard to put the brakes on it. So what if, if I could set a open source hard limit of capabilities permanently, where do I think the ideal number would be? Three and a half is probably fine. Four is, I mean, like, like probably, I mean like, probably enough fine that I'm willing to say, sure, if I have full control over stopping afterwards. Four, I'm nervous about what you might be able to do with it, but it's, you know, again, we're, we're talking about like existentially, it's 99 point, it's probably three, it's, it's two to three, nine safe at this point to make open source GPT-4, but not four. Right, like even now, because you don't know what people can do with it once you release it. But the problem is like you're releasing GPT-4, but you're also releasing everything they can do by iterating on GPT-4 to improve it. And you don't really know how many dumb things OpenAI did from the perspective of 10 years from now that we can then 10 years from now do a lot better. And you can't unopen source GPT-4 once you've done it. Right, so like who's to say what we could iterate? Like once you, the problem is like you don't get to stop progress where you put the, the halt number on. And that's why open sourcing is so dangerous, right? They can keep going off of what you've already released. They've done the expensive, hard part of the work in some important sense already. And you don't know where that stops. So I would say, you know, I'd rather stop around three and a half. I would be only somewhat nervous. Is my guess if we stopped at four. Um, if we open source GPT four and a half, I think we have at most one nine of we don't all die. We certainly don't have two. So we should stop pretty soon. Like, I don't want to play a fire on that level. Makes sense. So if we, related question, if we just paused development completely today, like on both closed source and open source, what do you think, like, do you think that the next 10 years would see like a specifically higher GDP growth exclusively due to AI than otherwise. And basically what I'm sort of like wondering here is like how much mundane utility basically is still right. hit, hidden that we just haven't actually tapped into yet because these things just take a long time for businesses to like get a hold of and people to figure out how to use them. And there's all sorts of applications you need to build around it. And, and it, you know, it's, it's not just a thing that like comes out and you have the API and yeah. then boom, boom, progress. It, right. So yeah. the answer is, Oh, a lot. Uh, like not like hard takeoff, like, you know, triple digit GDP growth or anything and probably not double digit GDP growth worldwide or in the US just from this current set of things. But if you tell me, okay, GPT-4 as it currently constituted is going to be the most capable foundation model for the next 10 years because, you know, some genie is going to stop every attempt at a superior training run and it mysteriously just won't work. Um, what happens to GDP? Then... Yeah, I expect like substantial boosts in GDP growth from the adoption of this technology. And we can argue over whether that's, you know, on the order of 0.1%, 1% or 10%. My guess is it's like north of one and south of 10. Um, but it's really hard to predict going forward because you don't know the pace of adaptation. You don't know the counterfactual. You don't know what regulations will come down on these things. You don't know how a lot of players will react to them. But, and you also don't know like to what extent the productivity will show up in the GDP statistics, which is always a question, right? Is the programmer efficiency jumping through the roof showing up in the GDP statistics? Like not entirely, right? I think that's a very strange question to answer properly. But I do think this is a, already a substantial boost in terms of like, if you were plotting like planning your tax rates and like, you know, your strategies for how to respond to the economic conditions. You should be much more optimistic than you would be if these things weren't happening. Yeah, there's there's a, a post that is just like catnip to me. I find it like uh, really good that you commented on, which is basically the claim that AGI timelines would cause real interest rates to be high. 
And the reason here is like interest rates go higher or the real interest rate goes higher when either A, the time discount is high or B, future growth is expected to be high. And so what's interesting about this case is like it doesn't really matter if the AGI is aligned or not, because uh, if everyone thinks the world is ending next year, uh, you don't care about saving your money and then the interest rate goes up. And then if you also, on the other hand, think you're going to be filthy rich in the next year, you don't care about saving your money <laughs> and the interest rate goes up. So the idea is like both scenarios should increase real interest rates. Now you introduced a lot of nuance and this is like what I definitely agree with, which is like, you know, the efficient market hypothesis, like maybe not the best model to try and inject this kind of idea into. And there's the, the sev several other points about like why this didn't make great sense. But my question for you is, do you think that there's some point where this model actually is right? Where GPT five, six comes out and you say, okay, the real interest rate has not moved up high. Now I'm willing to make this trade or do the details here in your post where you kind of list a number of reasons why this isn't a good trade always hold true? So I think if that happened, my response would be, there's a better trade, right? I mean, not the, so the trade is borrow all the money you can borrow at reasonable, at currently considered reasonable interest rates and invest it in AI. Like again, if, ignore existential risk and the implications that you might increase existential risk and you're just asking for the efficient market question, right? Like clearly if GPT five and six come out and GDP growth accelerates and interest rates aren't going higher, that means that we're not investing enough in taking advantage of these technologies, right? There isn't enough money flowing in. There's not enough competition for that. This money will, will have greatly oversized profits. I'm just thinking economically only here again, just to, for emphasis. So, and of course, interest rates will still be going up in the future as things continue to accelerate and exponentials happen like a bit fast. So you could easily have a situation in which the impact of AI in this sense is like doubling every, like starts at a year or two and then the doublings accelerate. And that the interest rate market is so big that like it takes a while to overwhelm the interest rate market, but then this happens very fast. Right? And once people start to see it happening, they start pricing in that it will happen again in the future for real and then interest rates go completely nuts. And so if you have managed to borrow money, it might not be that different from just keeping the money you borrowed in some important sense, right? Like, or a large portion of it. And that already happened in the last few years, right? Like I have a mortgage on my apartment where I pay two and a half percent fixed rate for 30 years. I could, in an efficient market, sell that back to the bank for like 60 cents on the dollar, right? Even though I am definitely paying my mortgage, just the fact that I can you know, invest in treasuries that earn five and a half means they are taking a huge bath on this and they should very much be willing to buy their way out of it. But of course, for various reasons, including taxes, I have no interest in doing that. And also it's impossible logistically. But the point being, you know, interest rates also have gone up. Like you also could in fact argue that <laughs> interest rates have gone up. Yeah. And like, this solves, I haven't actually said this out loud, but perhaps this solves the economic mystery of 2023 and people are just wrong about this not happening, right? So like, what is happening in 2023, right? Every economist thought soft landing was gonna be extremely difficult. Every economist thought that you would cause a recession if you pushed Fed rates into the fives, right? This rapidly, like this. What did we get? We got a strong job market. We got strong demand. We got declining inflation, right? Money's still worth something because there's more goods for that number of dollars to chase. So inflation went down in some important sense, but we saw the natural rate of interest, some sense go up. We've seen interest rates rise without damaging the economy. And one could say what's actually happening is artificial intelligence is creating a lot of great investment opportunities and ways to get higher returns on your money and various reasons to prefer money now to money in the future, thus raising interest rates a significant amount. And this is happening in the background, but the Fed is also raising their baseline rate of interest. So we didn't notice this is why the interest rates are going up in some sense, because the Fed like kind of does dictate the actual interest rates in some important sense by moving last, right? They have to see the AI impact and then adjust their base rates. But this is the reason we're surviving it without a recession, 
This is the reason why Biden might get reelected in 24, despite what the Fed is doing, right? Which would otherwise be a huge problem for him is because AI, right? And that like the answer to why isn't this happening? And I probably need to write this up now that I'm thinking it out loud. Perhaps the reason why AI isn't raising interest rates is that it's raising interest rates. Is that it's actually doing it? Well, th- yeah, see, it yeah, already yeah. Happened. yeah, yeah. It's like, actually it did. Um, well, I, I find it like... These things are just so complex though, right? Because like the, my counter to it, and I was actually, I I once read a post like several years ago that I I thought was really interesting, which is like, why are interest rates so historically low? And this is obviously not relevant anymore, but it it actually could apply to AGI, the conclusion that, that this guy drew. And he said, because maybe the market is pricing in that we cure aging. And so now the time preference is completely flipped. People don't care about having their money now. They're, they're going to live forever. And you could also make the case that like AGI, if maybe, maybe that's not the specific thing that it does, but it would probably do like some pretty weird things. So to just take I, the- I, I will just, I will just, I will just cut us off and say, that's not how traders think. Not enough of them. There's no freaking way. Well, that, like, well, 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 that's the more macro point that you make, right? Which is like, yeah, yeah like, like e- even that paper that is saying like, you know, AGI should increase interest rate. Like even that is kind of stretching how people that are trading for a living are probably actually like doing on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, and like, it's entirely possible that AI is having the impact now because like what's happened now has in fact woken them to enough mundane utility style advancements and accelerations that it's affecting impact rates now. And I think that's pretty plausible now that I say it out loud. But I don't think that they're pricing in the long-term stuff very well. And they're certainly not pricing in stuff like curing aging. Uh, nobody thinks that way. Nobody's ever think that way. Markets are much more myopic than that, always have been. Uh, one of my favorite anecdotal data points is you look at what happened to the stock market and other financial indicators during the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? When like the future got very, very different. And things basically didn't move very much, right? Everyone just sort of acted like, oh, I'm sure it'll work itself out somehow. <laughs> we'll all go together and then we go or something. Like, so don't worry about it and just trade as if this, the missiles aren't going to fly almost entirely. So things move by a few percent at most, even though like the president's going around saying the chances of nuclear war are between one and three and one and two in the next two weeks. So, you know, why sh- and everybody was paying attention to that full stop. So why should we expect people to respond to AI? Like in these huge ways, like it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that is true. I mean, yeah, if, you, if you're not around here to see tomorrow, like why, why care about selling now? Just like you might as well just take the optimistic bet. Yeah, and just general people have this, you know, this very much normalcy bias, right? Like even if you look at media, like if people predict how people were going to do these things, like the world is going to end in a week and most of the people just go about their day, right? Like. They, they, there's not much to be done. Like you don't get much benefit from, you know, up, uprooting everything. Like life is what life is and you can do things on the margin, but mostly you're kind of better off pretending the world isn't going to end until it suddenly ends from a just experiential perspective than like suddenly blowing it all on hookers and beer, right? Like it's just not a very good way to be happy or produce anything useful. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw I saw a um a, a tweet a, a day or two ago that basically said like the the GPT model Turbo Instruct can play chess at a level of about like eighteen hundred, and it's been like sort of previously reported that GPT actually cannot play chess, but it looks like it was just the like reinforcement learning models that are like bad at it, and so the implication here would be basically that reinforcement learning actually hurts reasoning abilities. Uh, so what's going on here? Do you think this is just a specific case of reinforcement learning, like happened to hurt chess reasoning capabilities, or do you think there's like a broader sort of like so lobotomizing? There are, other, there are other considerations. One of which is that someone at some point checked an evaluation of chat GPT's instruct model into their GitHub that checked chess. So we should not put it past them to have somehow fine tuned its ability to play chess if they suddenly can play chess. Uh, much better. Like, we can't rule that out. We don't know. So it's possible that this is a much more straightforward case. Yeah. But we definitely see a degradation of reasoning abilities. And I write about this in the next column somewhat already. Uh, based on ROHF. And in general, like, whenever you train a model to do something despite it not making any logical sense, the model is going to like 
learn not to make as much logical sense, to not value logical sense as much, is going to impair its ability to think. And I would point out here that this is also true in humans, right? Like to just sort of jump to the thing that I think people really should notice is if you tell me I have to go around in the world pretending things are true that aren't true, pretending not to notice correlations that are in fact accurate correlations and like living in a world in which logic just breaks down in weird ways constantly, I am not going to be able to turn that logical impairment entirely off when I move to other realms where you think I should be fine. And so we should beware when asking for this kind of special pleading on various issues of the damage that we are doing. Got it. So you've written before about the difference between this hardcore rationalist updating, right? Like take your priors and update based on new information versus what I think the commenter that you were referencing called the Ilya or Steve Jobs mentality of sort of relentless optimism. And so rationalists believe that you should, you know, consciously update your beliefs in the face of new information, just quit and admit when you're wrong. Ilya or Steve Jobs though, they're like way more focused on just like solve the problem at all costs. And we're just going to like figure it out until it's right. And I think your commentary was like, maybe we're just actually like both of these people are being rational and it's more a matter of vocabulary in the way that they are like expressing the way that they're like attempting to solve problems. But clearly it, to me, it seems like there is like people tend to have one mentality or the other. And so my question to you is which is better for getting things done? So I was a startup founder and a hardcore rationalist at the same time where I was simultaneously holding in my head both beliefs. Right? Like I had the belief of obviously we probably fail utterly. This is not going so great. In fact, it was not for the most part going so great. It did not end up going so great when all things were said and done. And simultaneously, the relentless optimism of, but we should you know, act as if it's going to work so that we make good decisions that cause it to work in some sense. And so what's going on with Ilya and Steve Jobs could be thought of as this kind of brain hack of, I know for the purposes where I need to know it, that this is not guaranteed to work. But I know that acting the way I would, if I assumed it was going to work, will cause me to make decisions that make it more likely to work and more likely to have better results. And so I will do that while having this other process in my head that keeps an eye on when it's going to do something that's actually crazy because the assumption isn't true and stop it from happening, right? Like a person like Steve Jobs, you don't actually see them doing things like borrowing from mobsters who will shoot them if the prototype doesn't work. Because we know it's going to work, right? No. Steve Jobs realizes that's dumb. Right? Ilya realizes that's dumb. And, and metaphorically, things that are like less blatant than that, but that like they don't set themselves up such that like if the thing doesn't work, disasters happen. They just say, oh, this is going to work. Let's do the thing that will cause it to work. And use this to you know, work their long days and drive everybody and keep everybody's morale up and figure out what the right ideas are and so on. And so, you know, when exhibited that way, I would say they've found a way to make the hybrid work for them in that sense. And, you know, I use it too in my own way. You know, I, do, I, I sort of emphasize more, like when you talk to me, you'll get the rationalist, like words out putting out of my mouth more often when I'm using, when I'm doing the hybrid than them. And in fact, I think they, they go, you know, they believe in more of the, you know, act as if it's just going to work thing. But yeah, I, I don't see a particular, like, acting for real as if their probability is 99%. You know, just, you know, if you thought your probability of succeeding was 9%, you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. But the odds say it's definitely worth it. So let's do this. You know, and if you have to say to yourself it's 90, then sure. But, you know, don't say it's 99.9, .9, not where it counts. So as a startup founder and someone who writes like crazy prolifically, what is the Z Moshkowitz production function? How do you get so much done? So part of it is just, you know, practice, 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 certainly. Um, I would say I am constantly working in the sense of like every, like every other creative, like I'm constantly looking for inputs. I'm constantly thinking about what something implies, what do I have to say about it? The basic workflow is I have three giant monitors. Uh, because I found that a few very, very large monitors are better than a lot of small monitors. And 
I have a lot of open tabs and a lot of open tab groups. And I'm continuously scanning for uh, various, I'm scanning uh, various RSS feeds and Twitter for, uh, in my inbox and other sources for, for other, for new, new information and new sources. When I find the new source, I put it in the appropriate group. Or if it's like, I know exactly what to do with it and I have the time right now, I'll just put it in immediately. Um, I then organize these things logically as I go. And then, you know, sometimes I'll go over them and I'll like write more or I'll edit or whatever. And then periodically I'll say, here's a compilation of the things on this topic or these related topics that I've had that, you know, and then I'll edit it and organize it into a unified whole and I'll put it out there. And then every now and then I wish I did this more, but it, it's hard to do. You'll, you'll find a concrete isolated thing and you'll, you'll write that up in more detail and you'll push that through and like it'll have more coherence and like hopefully stand the test of time more. But mostly it's just relentlessly like being able to break up. Part of it is just being able to hold the stuff in your head enough that you can reference it and then break it up into chunks so that, you know, the moment I, you know, I, I have just a list of the links and like each one I'm like, oh, I know where that goes. I know what this relates to this week. I know how to like add this, integrate this in and how this impacts the other things I was saying and how I need to move other stuff around based on that. And you just slowly build up a superstructure that way. But yeah, a lot of it is just, you know, you iterate. I had, I had years of doing it for COVID that transferred mostly pretty cleanly. At what point do you think LLMs will have a significant, be a significant input to that? There is significant input already in the sense that um, when I want to like answer certain types of questions or learn certain types of things, I will use LLMs rather than use Google or asking a person because it's faster and more efficient. Often I will check intuitions using LLMs. I should be using LLMs more for things like grammar and other things like that, but I haven't figured out how the workflow is worthwhile there just given how I happen to work. In particular, I use LLMs often for asking questions about papers that are clearly not worth actually reading. Because like, you can't stop and read every 40 page paper that comes across your desk. You just don't have the time. So often you want to, you know, you, you, you can do things like control F for the words extinction and existential, but like, that's really not a good check of whether they're saying things about some, about that. So you can, you know, you can ask, ask Claude and Claude will be pretty good at identifying whether or not they address. Like if you ask it like, does this paper address this topic at all? That's the kind of question that's very, very good at answering the question and like pointing you to vaguely where it does that. And then if it does, you read the section. And if it doesn't, you say, okay, it doesn't, right? You know, uh, or ask like, how does it respond? Yeah, how does it do this particular technique? Or it's a much better search function than control F, right? Like it's, it's, as long as you then read the text afterwards. So again, like it's definitely a, a boost. If you're asking when the LM can write the damn thing, we're not close. We're nowhere close. And I'm, it's not obvious to get there before the end. What version of GPT along with like fine tuning and saying, here's every like new source that I am likely to look at. Here's the last, you know, 200 AI newsletters that I've read. I want you to search all these new sources, aggregate them into similar categories and write the newsletter. You think that's actually not till AGI or do you think that oh, there's no, like- Oh, I was talking about like actually writing the words. Like yeah, actually yeah. doing the analysis, like creating the outputs. Like I'm not sure that's not AI complete, like in a, you know. Got it, got way. it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the thing you describe is probably doable now in a useful way. The problem is that it takes a very high quality threshold before that is better than nothing. And so you have this problem of it's very hard to help climb on it, right? If I, if I had a version that was like, this is useful, but could be more useful if it was better, but it's worth using now, or like at least not too bad to use now. It's like not as efficient maybe, but like it's definitely serving a purpose. And then I can help climb on that and iterate and get to where I want, as opposed to, no, I have to put in a bunch of programming work while it's terrible. And I still have to check all my usable sources anyway, before it gets to the point. Like, like, I always use chronological feeds on all of my social media and I always, in RSS and so on, I don't use any kind of AI style filters except very, very crude, like stop spamming me style filters at most. Precisely because a lousy filter just means you need to check the damn unfiltered version anyway. So it accomplishes nothing and we're not there yet. Uh, but yeah, I could probably um, be well served by having an LLM scour the rest of the internet for highly plausibly contextually important things and having it present them to me 
uh, especially if it also checks for redundancy with my current feeds. But again, like that requires a bunch of coding work and a bunch of iteration and a bunch of time upfront investment. And I at least haven't chosen to do that myself. And, you know, I mean, I'm accepting grants if somebody really wants to supercharge things and wants to like bump me up to the point where I can just hire engineers. But like, that's definitely not in my price range right now. So I've had Robin Hansen on this show before and, you know, his views come off like quite strange to someone who's not initiated to his style of thinking. He's very okay with the sort of this idea that humans will merge with AI and that our descendants will be totally unrecognizable from us today. But he also thinks that's totally fine and he doesn't see, have any like moral qualms about it whatsoever. And it kind of seems to me like that's an extreme case, but it sort of feels like at some point all alignment questions end up boiling down to political or moral arguments about what a good future actually looks like. And like these deep, really deep questions about like, what, what does it mean to live a meaningful life for humans? Do, do you agree that that's true? Or are, is there a way where we can live in sort of like a more plur, pluralistic world where we do so today? There, there, there's yeah. several, several things to address there. The first thing is, I think he would agree with me strongly that when we say merge with AI, that's almost always people talking nonsense. It's like the Mass Effect 3 ending where you like merge. The, <laughs> okay, you know? yeah. Like, like you're saying words, but it doesn't really mean anything, right? Yeah. Like you have no idea what you're saying or how that translates or what that would, you know, operationalize as. And mostly you're just imagining something that narratively you kind of like vibey want to happen, but that isn't the thing, right? So like, I still think it's the correct ending to choose because the other endings definitely kill you. But regardless of the edited extended version where they don't kill you or at least don't kill you immediately, it's just not actually accurate um, to think that way. But like, you know, it's because you're, it's like, okay, this was meant to be something smarter than it technically is. Like maybe it could be something like, but like the others are purely, anyway, um, the way I would describe Robin Hansen's position is, yeah, we're all going to, there are not going to be any humans. There's not going to be anything that they, that even, that, 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 resembles the human all that much and that's okay. And I'm highly in favor of moving towards this goal. Um, yep. And if you believe that is what's going to happen by default, then yes, a huge portion of what you decide comes down to the question of, but that's good actually? Like, do we agree with this? Uh, he thinks we'll be able to leave legacies to this artificial intelligence that meaningfully reflect like things that we are or cared about. Uh, I don't think that's true in Hansonian style scenarios, if you get the kind of scenario Hansen is envisioning, which I think is plausible. I think it's like very plausible that we'll end up in a Hansonian future if we don't do something about it. I just think that's bad. That like the legacies that we're talking about, like, I mean, things like, oh, we kept a lot of aspects of the Linux kernel because it was just like easier to build off of what we had rather than starting from scratch. Like that does not have any value to me. Like, I don't feel like our legacy has been preserved because we kept some of the Linux kernel or like anything of that nature or anything else I can think of that would survive the kind of evolutionary competitive pressures that Hansen is imagining would happen to the AIs that would cause them to diverge so much from us. So yeah, I, I think you have, so I would say, you know, does it boil down, like your question, your central question, but does it boil down to value questions? I think the answer is not entirely, but they're important. So, you know, we have these strong disagreements about what actions, including the default case, with what probabilities lead to what types of outcomes, right? Like what, what futures are we headed towards? What are the possibilities open to us? You know, how do we steer between those possibilities? Are all questions that are, you know, well, I mean, how if we know, right? Like to a large extent, we're trying to figure it out. And we have our best guesses and we disagree about that. And a lot of the disagreements are very, very intelligent, genuine with good points on both sides. And then, there are also the vast group, vast, while simultaneously the vast majority of people have like views that have not actually thought these things through and are very ill considered or completely disingenuous, right? Like, but like among the people who have considered it, you know, the actual ways to steer this towards better, towards different things, those are tricky, right? And knowing what, what you can do to steer towards various outcomes is tricky. And in fact, like we have the question of which, which intermediate steps lead to what type of lived experiences and outcomes and, and, what things would be present in that future universe over what time frame? Very good questions. Now, if you could agree on all those questions somehow, you would then have this boiled down to a moral issue, right? You would then be able to say, okay, you know, Tzvi and Robin agree 
on what would happen given what decisions by humanity. And humanity is here to make a decision based on that. We have to decide if we should go to Spee's world, which has in it much less optimized intelligences and has the following, you know, potential vulnerabilities and long-term disequilibria and other things, but he thinks provides a lot more value. Or Robin's world, which has these other things that Robin thinks provide a lot more value, which world should we choose? And we can have a debate and make a decision, you know, for some value of we. But we're not there yet. We're nowhere near the Gat Galaxy, right? We're, we're still very much in the, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, I think that it's, it is an important question to sort out. Do you think that AI is getting control of the future and they're no longer being humans, us not having great grandchildren, is good actually compared to the alternative. And there are people for several different reasons who say yes, right? There are the, you know, antinatalists, negative utilitarians who think that humanity just suffers, right? The, the ultimate Buddhists in some broad metaphorical sense. You have the people who think that the AI has more value than we do because it's more intelligent. They have the people who think that like evolution is the thing that matters or is valuable and like who are we to interfere with it or something like that. You have the people who think, well, you know, I care about myself and my own short-term future and I don't care what happens in the long run. So if this allows me to enjoy the next 10 years of cool AIs in it, then I don't care. You have the people who think that, you know, right now humans have value, but the humanity that holds back the singularity would be so crippled and morally broken and experientially broken and uh, disheartened and so some combination of these things that it wouldn't have value or not have any value and therefore we're better off just letting it take its course in some sense. You have the people who like value nature and think that humans are bad for nature and that AI would be good for nature and they are wrong both because they're wrong about what's valuable and they're wrong that AI would preserve nature. It won't. It will wipe it out so much more efficiently than humans ever could. If we have these scenarios, you know, and there are several other things of that ilk. And then within the people who want to preserve humanity, there are those who want to preserve humanity in order to do certain specific things or for certain ways of life or whatever. And people who want it to be so that people can do whatever they want. It's an important sense. And there are people who admit they don't know. Right, who think like oh, we want humans to flourish, we want humans to like enjoy vibrant, interesting, complex lives, and we don't know exactly how to do that, and we're punting that until we do, because that's a really, really hard problem. And like we've been having this conversation since long before, and I'm largely in that camp. When I ask myself what I value, I have a lot of meaningful intuition pumps and things to say about that, but. Yeah, I don't pretend to have all the answers. I do think it's much easier to tell things you don't value and you don't want than to know exactly what it is you do want. And that we'd be in much better shape if we could specify what human values were and what we actually cared about in a way that like we could have it be interpreted by an AI or by another human. Well, and I don't think we're there yet at all. So I think that would be my response. Speedy, this has been an awesome conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. It was a good time. You asked different questions, and I always want people to ask different questions.